Um, it, it is very important that you know we acknowledge um, our members of our community while they are still here. Street names are nice, but having something memorable in an institution as a promise is not necessary. Right? It's located in the heart of central Brooklyn. So before I get it any further, I would like a dear friend and a senior member of the political class that Dr. Jimmy Clark is from to come and pray to it in the way of the location. It's just for God. Of our silent years, the woman that has been created so that our lives can be better, the woman that our mighty God has anointed so that our lives will be richer, the woman that our mighty God has lifted up so that we can be who we are today is being honored. And I know the omnipotent God has done a mighty great job when you were born to your mother. When you left your home and came to these lands of America, and when you remembered that all you needed to do was what your purpose was, to be strong, to build, to make it right when it was wrong, to say it whether they like it or not, and then to change what America would look like. Almighty God, we thank you for you and FC Clark, a mighty woman, that has come. You have run the race and you have never left behind. You took God with you. God followed you. God anointed you. And then God brought you again so that we can follow in your footsteps. What a mighty God you serve. What a mighty woman you are. Not just for New York, not just for Central Brooklyn. You Drag me all over the United States <laughs> so that I may stand. And tonight, God is our divine giver, and God has given you to us. May long life be yours, the blessing for your family, your husband, and your children. Our wonderful Congresswoman, God knows we can't do it without you. We won't do it without you. If I'm not here tomorrow, I'll be with you. And if you're not here, I know you'll be with us. And that's because of the honor and the glory that God has given you for our lives. We cannot thank God enough for you. Yuna S. E. Clark, my sister, they wouldn't be in Academy School of Science and Technology without you. Ten million dollars strong over 28 years. We have gotten in scholarship for our children and we have three students already who are now multi-millionaires. It could never, it could never have happened without you. And I just want to thank you because when you beat me up, I took it. <laughs> When you told me I was not in your district, I took it. But then you didn't leave me. You did not leave me. You took me by my hand and you carried me where I needed to go because it was all about the children. And look at where we are today. <laughs> my buddy, my friend, God gave you to us. And we are grateful to God 
Long live Dr. Una S. Seacorn. Yes. So Out 
or somebody you know, somebody who was pushing for us, or somebody representing black folks, somebody representing freedom folks, didn't know she had to make it black, it's okay. Well, <laughs> uh, but it was really important to see someone like that. Uh, and I happen to have a big mouth. I think that's probably have a slightly bigger one, but she wanted to go out. Uh, and she spoke what she, what she needed to speak on behalf of us. She invited me to the council. I think I spoke about the Red Season, I think, at the time, uh, as a student. That, coming into that space and having someone like the Dr. Paul can let you see what you can be. Uh, and that just means so much. So who else can have the inaugural Women in Politics lecture series than Dr. Paul? And I'm honored to have been uh, with Congressman Clark uh, in St. Gabriel's uh, Church. St. Gabriel's birthed a lot of the folks, uh, not because we had people like Dr. Paul. She is a trailblazer, and I'm so happy she's there to smell her flowers now. Um, I am one to never think that I was here first, speaking the things first. There were people before me, and one of those folks was Dr. Paul. At a time when it was even harder to say the things that I'm saying now, when it was even harder to fight for what people need to fight for. So if people didn't pave the way in those even more difficult times, folks like me wouldn't do it. So I'm just so appreciative of that. And I want to say thank you, thank you uh, a thousand times. Uh, and I want to thank Megan Edwards for being here. I don't know if another college would have had the wherewithal to celebrate the way we're celebrating, celebrate the people who mean the most to us, the trailblazers, the famous to us. That's why Megan Edwards is so important. And that's why we can never let them take it away from us and take away the meaning of what they're right. supposed to be. Thank you so much, please. Thank you. And now I would like to call up Provost Antoinette Coleman. She's just been here a couple of months, but she's already taken the college by storm. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Clark. We don't know each other as well as everyone else in this room knows you. But I first met you through Dr. Castro and the principal. And I stood back and I looked. And I said, you know, a little girl from Queens, you've been in Brooklyn. Because I should have learned a lot of the lessons that you have taught the many in this room. So, as a new provost, I have a lot of lessons to learn here at Baker. So, I want that phone number. And there's nobody else there. And I want to be able to make a call and get some advice. Because, as the president says, Megan's on the move. And we're going to move Megan into the spotlight with the president we have and her team. But, we need your stage of life. So, I thank you for being the wonderful woman that you are. And again, I want to get to know you, get your advice, and I think everyone else in here loves you, and of course, I love you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I would like to hear from and so this is our DD role for which the nationally ranked Department of Public Administration. <laughs> Thank 
actually feeling sorry. But she launched the women in government academic court so that we would celebrate many women who answer the call of government service. And, 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 and not just on this one day, please. Remember that women in government service do a lonesome job and often we are not recognized. So I want to salute you for recognizing uh, Congresswoman Clark, but also for recognizing the need to have a court and maybe more to celebrate women in government. Thank you.
of the Student Government Association, Ms. Joanna Dorsey, also communicates that she wants to run for office one day. She has a powerful toolbox and path to follow. These are the models and stories that our communities house, but are not always shared. Now, generations later, at a college in the same community that is home to Dr. Clark, that is a part of a city university, that is a part of a university that Dr. Clark once frequented as an adjunct lecturer. Uh, uh, there is no better way than to kick off this lecture series, who also serves as the current trustee of the city university. So thank you for joining us today. And now we would like to bring up Lorene Daniel Favors, attorney Lorene Daniel Favors, to do some ancestral violence. <laughs> And just to make sure we're on the same page, if I say the word libation by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with that word? Okay, at least one or two of you did not have your hand up. So for the purposes of making sure we're all on the same page, you will allow me the opportunity to provide a brief explanation. Uh, for those of you from the Gen X era, you may remember Tupac Corn out of the Lip of Homies, and how many that we have done to acknowledge those who have gone on before us. This is considered a libation. In the libation, you will find a variety of ways, a variety of languages, but it is an ancestral African tool that we use to remind ourselves of the fact that we stand on the shoulders of greatness and that we stand on the shoulders of all of those who have gone on before us. So traditionally, you will again see libations perform a variety of different ways. What we're going to do today is I'm going to make a statement that acknowledges the, the beauty of our history, the common history that we share, the common present that we share, and the future that we're all building towards. And we will use a phrase called ashe. If I say ashe, does anyone know what that means? Yeah, yeah, I'm in agreement with the spark of life, so to speak. And we will say our shame to those statements, and then we will open up the circle. And if you have the name of an ancestor, someone who has already gone on before, who has transitioned from this world into the next, we have to offer up their name as a part of this libation so that the best of their energy can be used. Ashe? Ashe. Okay. So we all stand. We hold this water as a symbol of our shared past as people of African descent, the first people, those who birthed civilization, language, math, science, and all of the great riches upon which we rely. For the beauty of that shared history, we collectively say, Ashe. I pour water now to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west, in acknowledgement of the four cardinal directions from which our ancestors traveled laid down roots, built up society, and had dreams of greatness for all of us who would descend from them. And for their willingness to work on behalf of us all, we say Ashe. Ashe. I pour now to the right and to the left, an acknowledgement of the need for balance between masculine and feminine energy, a foundation upon which all healthy societies are built, and upon which we must depend if we hope to have a hope as a people and a future. And for that balance, we say Ashe. Ashe. We pour now for those ancestors who woke up one day about their day to day affairs they went, teaching their children, birthing their babies, herding their animals, tending to their crops, who that evening found themselves in chains, found themselves in the belly of a ship, found themselves preparing for a journey that they had not known, horrors that they could not envision, and for what they endured, for what they overcame, and even to what they were at some point had to succumb. We acknowledge that history. All that we are to learn from it, we hold the lessons of that history dear to us today. And for that history, we say, Ashe. For those who resisted on the plantations in the Maroons, in the Palmare region, in the Palenque, and in the resistance Maroon villages, those who found every form of petite Marunage and grand Marunage, all who knew that resistance was at our core because freedom was our birthright, 
for them that legacy and their direction, we say Ashe. We pronounce the elders from whom we can continue to learn a great deal and to youth to whom we will leave this world, ideally in a better condition than the one it was, it was when we inherited it. And for them, we say Ashe. We open up the circle now. If you have the name of any ancestor who has contributed to your growth as an individual or to our growth as a people, we ask that you offer it up and we will greet you with an Ashe. I offer up my grandmother, Gwendolyn Smith Walton. I offer my mother. Let's say them loudly. Some people. Yes. I offer my mother. I offer my mother. I offer I'm saying. I'm saying. A young boy that just got killed, which I will eulogize tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Ethan Zachary Older, one of my first, former students. I'm saying. I'm saying. Family, we acknowledge the best of those energies that were offered into the circle, and we pray that the wisdom that our ancestors hold would be a guiding light. And it would direct us in the direction that we should go, a direction towards freedom and justice, and would empower us to stand firmly on your shoulders. And we'll close out this circle with an ashe three times. Ashe, ashe, ashe. Thank you. Thank you. 
not just because of the work you've done, not just because you've touched people. We've all, you know, we've all touched people, we've all been with people in that. Um, but in terms of policy, as Dr. Gay was saying, um, none of them will leave a legacy of policy and policy makers that will ever rival. Um, so having said that, I promise let's stop. Um, <laughs> It is an honor to, to co-host um, this lecture by you, Dr. Clark, and um, I, I hope we all benefit uh, from your wise words. Stay well, everyone. Thank you. Uh, next, we would like to call up assembly member Ryan Cunningham. It's my congresswoman, Zeth B. Clark, President Ramsey, Chair Blair, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, let me just say really quickly that Dr. Clark is someone who I first laid eyes on when I'm eight years old. And I remember she came to my church, and I was in awe of this awesome woman with this incredible voice and passion. And because of her, and because of the work she's done in the city council, it's the reason why I even wanted to run for government. So Dr. Clark, thank you for setting me on my path. <laughs> you know, I was thinking as we were came up on some of your numerous accomplishments that we're still taking victory laps for. I think about the Cape Market Project that you organized. I think about the parade ground that we play on. I think about the commute event, the AKA dollar bags that you championed while you're in the city council. Yeah, exactly. All of these things happen because of your hard work and your dedication. The 31 women that are not elected to the city council is on your shoulders. So just want to say thank you for the endless contributions, but also more importantly, thank you for being a truth teller. I remember times when I thought I was ready, and Dr. Clark would look at me and say, not ready. And when it was time to be ready, she looked at me and said, are ready. And I thank you for your honesty, for taking my calls in Jamaica when you're on vacation with Lester Clark. You are a phenomenal woman, and I love you. I am grateful for all the things I've accomplished um, and all the titles I've had, but the biggest title I can call is your son. And thank you for that. I appreciate it. I know he's going to do great things in that assembly house, right? I would like to acknowledge Miss Andrea Dawes. Um, I see her in the back. I don't know if she wants to see you. Come on up. Come on up. You got to be back to the table. No. But she, she's always a great partner and helps to, to turn people out as well. And not to mention, she is the niece of Dr. Yuna S.T. Clark. So thank you. And Louise, come back up. You are a sponsor. <laughs> Dr. Clark, I think everyone here, we are very clear about the significant contribution that you have had in all of our lives, personally and as a people. And the first time I had an opportunity to sit across uh, from this team doctor, I was so struck, not so much by his brilliant political genius and the prowess and the statistical and the strategic insight that she had, but as the granddaughter of a woman from Jamaica who had come here with her children, some of whom she had to leave back home while she could work until she could go back and get them, I saw in her so much of what my own grandmother had dreamed about and so much of what she had lived for and what she was so proud of for her country of us to come into this space and to lead unabashedly, unashamedly, centering the people of the Caribbean and people of African descent in a way that spoke truth to power. And while she is no longer here, I thank you, Dr. Because it wasn't just for your own that you fought, you fought for all of us. And you really did set an example that empowers so many of us to keep going when we feel like perhaps we need to do it. Thank you for never sitting down and for giving us a
concrete example of what excellence looks like. Oh. Thank you. And now we're moving more and more into the program, and I would like to call up Isis McIntosh. Ms. Isis McIntosh, she is the executive director of the PDPA, PA, the Progressive Democratic Political Association. And this club, political club, is Dr. Clark's brainchild. She never considered herself someone who curried political favor with any organization. She created her own and set her own path. And so now you will hear from the executive director. You want me to come back here? Yes. Yeah, yeah. right. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Isis McIntosh, and I'm just so honored um, not just to be here, but to even serve as executive director for the Progressive Democrat Political Association of Central Brooklyn, which we knowingly and lovingly call PDPA. So PDPA was actually founded by Dr. Clark back in 1992. So this year we're actually celebrating 30 years of the organization. <laughs> However, the organization has actually been around before then. That's when the paperwork and everything went into the State Department, etc. Um, however, through this organization, Dr. Clark and law have been able to not just build the bench or not just been able to work on getting folks elected, not just in Central Brooklyn, but across the city and across the state, but also has worked on a number of civic education and grown up a number of generations. Um, proud to say that we have members that have been members since this age, and now new members that are now here um, in, in this iteration. So our organization, um, thankfully, at this point, has an executive committee with none other than um, Congresswoman Yvette B. Clark, Assemblywoman Latrice and Walker, Kevin, Senator Kevin Parker, excuse me, as well as Senator Zelma Myrie. Um, we've also had a number of executive committee members from former councilwoman, now Commissioner Lori Humbo, um, then we were President Diana Richardson, and a, and a host of others. So we really just appreciate the space, not just to meet number, a, a, number, me, a number of times a week with this amazing and just illustrious woman, but also just to really sit at her feet and hear how things not just work and how the agenda has gotten done, but that we don't have to bang our heads and rack our brains on how to continue to do the great work. One thing that I really love about our political association is it really has a, a number of generations that work together. It's not just, you know, the young going against, you know, those that are more senior, but it actually goes, um, you know, doing a lot of cross-learning as well as hosting a number of enrichment events, really bringing a lot of attention to not just Caribbean Americans, but also African Americans and our experience and what we need to do to be heard. The latest thing that we've been working on has been our equity agenda really making sure that in a number of areas from criminal justice reform to affordable housing and home ownership, that elected officials and folks that are interested in really getting the endorsement of the club and of the executive committee understand that this isn't just a talk in front of us and hear all the great things that you want to promise, but it really is a partnership that is important to make sure that our constituencies get the best representation possible and become our representation. So thank you so much, Dr. Clark, for being a mentor and, you know, a godmother. And we love you and we appreciate you. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge Assembly Member Stephanie Zimmerman. Yes. Come on up. Thank you.
copy the government assemblywoman Stephanie Finnerman and to Assemblyman Brian Cunningham. Uh, to the beloved community here present, it's certainly my honor, my privilege to come and to be a part of this family gathering and the launching of this series of women in government. So many friends, so many uh, family members in the room. Um, I've just been going down memory lane uh, with each individual who have come up to say a word or two uh, and to share accolades about uh, Dr. Una Clark. Um, and that pictorial is a trip right there. <laughs> um, just to look at all of the ways in which uh, Dr. Clark has been uh, sort of pictured out there. Uh, I, I stand here on the campus of Mega Everest College, uh, mindful of the fact that we have lived in this community all of my life. Um, and this is walking distance from where we physically live in Brooklyn. And we have walked this walk together, my mother and I, all of my life. Because before there was a Mega Everest College, there was the thought of having a Mega Everest College. And my mother was at every meet where that thought was being uh, cultivated, where it was being nurtured, where it was being strategically um, discussed. Um, and like many of the institutions in Central Brooklyn uh, during the time that uh, Dr. Clark uh, first came to the United States, uh, she was an activist first and foremost. So you all have picked up on a certain part of her life. I want to give you a little bit about what got her there. Uh, because it wasn't magic, it was work. And, uh, you know, Dr. Clark uh, was a part of the early childhood movement. The early childhood education movement. She was a part of the daycare movement. And I think you heard uh, uh, Assemblywoman Stephanie Zinnerman uh, speak to this. There were a number of leaders in our community that came out of that same movement. The Honorable Shirley Chisa was a part of that movement. State Senator Belknap Montgomery was a part of that movement. There were so many women who were mobilizing, organizing Black women because they could not have child care for their children. They were working always in the workplace, but there was no child care available to them. So you know what? Because there was no child care available to them, I was in the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Clark would pick me up from school and I would be in the meeting. And listening to how these women were organizing, were mobilizing, Dr. Clark started as a PTA. Dr. Clark started at the Block Association. So when people ask me, how did you all get into politics? I tell them from the ground up. This wasn't a, oh, we just going to wake up one day and we're going to shake the world. No, this was neighbor by neighbor, liberal. And every single one of those neighbors had the right to give me a spanking given to them by Dr. Clark. So I grew up in a village that reinforced the values that Dr. Clark had. She knew the work she was doing was serious work and that uh, I could not be messing up on the side because there would be nothing that would stop her from her mission to make sure that our communities were liberated during a time when we were being severely marginalized in our society, in Central Brooklyn. And so, full circle, it was that work. So when people ask, well, you know, how did she get there? It was neighbor by neighbor, community by community, organization by organization. Dr. Clark never forgot where she came from. Never ever forgot this. I went to more Jamaican dinner dances than a <laughs> Remember, no child keeping. <laughs> so I'm that kid in the corner in my pretty dress with the adults dancing on the floor 
and me eating cake in the corner with my brother. You all know about that. Yeah. Right? The dinner dance. But not only did we go to the Jamaican dinner dance, we went to the Panamanian dinner dance, we went to the Grenadian dinner dance, we went to the Trinity dinner dance. We went to everybody's dinner dance. The Lions Club. She made herself a part of every concentric circle wherever she was invited, just in terms of common bonds. It did it even in a social context, we were there. And so she helped to build a village. She helped to build a village. And then they looked at what does this village need? Well, we need an educational institution. We need a place of higher learning where they won't discriminate against our children, where our children, where our students, where our scholars will feel comfortable in being who they are and being educated about who they are and using that education as a spark for excellence. We grew up in Central Brooklyn during the Black Power movement. The Black Power movement. That's a little bit different from the civil rights movement. It's a little bit different. Dr. Clark, you may see him picture me and my brother. We wore froze because Dr. Clark started printing her hair in the 60s. She started wearing dashiki. We were all wearing dashiki. Dr. Clark decided she was going to take up crochet. I had a red, black, and green poncho with a black tan that I wore first grade. <laughs> first grade. <laughs> Dr. Clark was a militant. <laughs> and she still is. I'm going to take you back a little bit more because Dr. Faber said something. So just to give you a little bit of the chemistry, Dr. Clark comes from a rural part of Jamaica. Very rural. A farm. She comes from a farm. I didn't realize it when they were shipping me down there <laughs> until I got there. <laughs> and I was on the farm. And the mosquitoes were like this big. <laughs> and that farm was on the lower ground of a mountain. And at the top of that mountain is an area called a compound town. That is where the Maroons waged a war against the British and won their freedom from the British. That is where Dr. Clark's mother is from. And so she comes with the warrior spirit. It's in her DNA. With, within that is also the whole idea of the village and everyone being a part of that village and where one goes, all goes. And so she was never selfish in terms of what she saw in terms of vision for my brother and I, because she's navigating America, mind you. But she saw it for every black child in Brooklyn. She saw it for every black family in Brooklyn. Remember, black power movement, right? So that's the lens, because we're coming out of a period of civil unrest, similar to what we're dealing with right now. So all of what Dr. Clark has become is with laid in a foundation that started in Jamaica. Her father, which I didn't talk about, who was the farmer, was a guardian. He was in the movement organizing with Marcus Garvey. So you take the Maroon, you take the Garvey, I can send the, the daughter to America in the midst of the civil rights movement, and boom, here's Dr. Clark. <laughs> So I've been blessed to be raised in a household by someone who is passionate about humanity, passionate about lifting the lives of others, 
passionate about education. Dr. Clark was sent to the United States by her father who owned the farm, who saved his nickels to send his children to be foreign students to become an accountant. <laughs> She's still doing people's taxes. <laughs> but what happened is that the movement, the movement grabbed her. And in the midst of a public school education strike, she flipped. She said, this is it. No one will ever stop the education of our children. And it will definitely not be some white guy who doesn't understand who we are as a people. And when the teachers marched out, the parents marched in. They marched into the schools. They took over the classrooms. And that was the first iteration of critical race theory. <laughs> After a while, everybody had a tail. Everyone was wearing red, black, and green. Everybody was wearing dashiki. That was the environment that was cultivated uh, and in which Dr. Clark came uh, to her, I think, consciousness around how she could be of service to others. And that's all she ever really focused on was what could she learn that she could share with someone else. So everyone on the block knew everything that she knew because she was the Black Association president. And if you needed to know how to get your children into the, into the summer youth employment program, you went to Dr. Clark. If you needed to know how to navigate a government agency, you went to Dr. Clark. And if you needed a babysitter, she would offer me up. <laughs> <laughs> and so we are, uh, we are grateful uh, for the life that Dr. Clark is leading. She has not stopped working a moment. Uh, she is retired from elected office, but her work continues to keep me. It continues. This woman is on Zoom. <laughs> she is Zooming everywhere. Um, she continues uh, to, listen, there is no one I know better on WhatsApp, Facebook, <laughs> and every social media platform than Dr. Clark. She loves people. She loves interacting with people. She loves young people. I'm getting too old for my mother. <laughs> she wants to make sure that this next generation is equipped with everything they need, with the knowledge, the context in which they are operating, so that they can use that as a source of inspiration, of power, to trail, to continue to blaze the trail that needs to be blazed for the generations that are coming behind you. And so I am just so honored to be here um, to see what Dr. Blair is doing here at Megger along with her colleagues um, in giving recognition. We have a living legend, and we have a number of living legends around us, and we need to take the opportunity to unearth their legacies so that, again, as a, nothing we are creating right now is new. You know, Black Lives Matter, and we were like, yes, Black Power, very, very similar vibe. And we were fighting against police brutality. So I just wanted to uh, take this moment to give, give you a little context of the woman that you're celebrating today. Outside of what you've seen and what you've heard about her in the elected office, this is what she's made of. This woman is tough. She is no joke. And people ask me, how's your mother? I love her. She does this, she does that. I was like, imagine being raised by her. <laughs> imagine it. And I am uh, a, a devoted fan and a beneficiary in so many ways of uh, her sacrifices, um, of, of her uh, adventurousness. It, she never uh, turned down an assignment. She's always uh, 
was curious enough to, to take a leap of faith with my brother, my father, my myself uh, as a family to go into places that we never thought we'd ever um, enter and then open them up for all of our neighbors to come in, for all of the people she worked with to come in. She wants to make sure that we have access to, to whether it's a small business. You talk about the dollar van struggle. Dr. Clark, you would have thought she was driving a van when she went into the city council to get him on the van driving. Um, you know, it, it, that's, that's the passion. So I'm going to, uh, as we say in Washington, D.C., you back the balance of my time. I want to thank you all for coming out uh, to hear from Dr. Clark. Uh, you'll hear for yourself because she she got stories and I, I hope we are videoing but trying to get Dr. Clark to write a book uh, for quite some time. She keeps talking about it, but she she can't sit still long enough to do something like that. So as you all get snippets, we can maybe at some point in time pull it all together to help her uh, with the volume that, that that can be produced about this woman who came from sugarcane fields, unpaved roads no motor vehicles to the United States of America, to central Brooklyn, to this community, to help build, to help undergird, to give um, recognition and face to the struggles of people of African descent, and in specific, people who came from the Caribbean region who were not recognized and who were not um, uh, uh, in any way uh, encouraged uh, during a time when uh, black power uh, was not pan Africanist necessarily. That's right. And so I want to uh, thank you, Dr. Clark, for uh, expanding your wings so that we understand our, our combined destiny um, and the ways in which we need to move together in unity to get things done. Everything that I talked about, this very place that you're sitting in, it came out of a united black community. That's right, right. It That's came right. out of people in agreement that there needed to be a black educational institution in CUNY in Central Brooklyn. It didn't come from, oh, it's my idea, no, it's my idea, it's my idea, no, it's my idea. No, no, no. They understood power, Got it. and they knew that unity was their power, and that no one person could get enough credit to make it work building this campus that you are all enjoying today. I remember where Mega started, and it was down the street. It, it, you all, it, it, it was a Catholic school that shut down, yeah. that started Mega Aristotle. And here we are today, or whatever that means. God bless you, God keep you, God strengthen you. God bless you, God bless 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 you. On November the 5th, history was made in New York when the 40th district that was created for the consulatic elections was won by a lady, a Caribbean American, Una Clark. That was an historic day. She came up against the odds, so much so that it affected a recount after Carl Andrews was declared the winner. And the lady, God's lady, mm -hmm. as she is, decided that I ain't taking it so. Mm -hmm. And there was a recount, and she was declared the winner. Yeah. Una Clark, it has been a few months now. Let me say welcome to Culture Share. A lot of us call her mama because she is really like the mother of the Caribbean community here in New York. She was first elected in 1991. 
to represent the newly created 14th Council District in Brooklyn. City Council member Una Clark, is the, and it's Dr. Una Clark, is the first Caribbean-born woman to serve in the city, New York City Council. And as a member of the City Council, she served on committees on aging, youth services, and economic development. And she has been chair of the subcommittee on mental health, mental retardation, alcoholism, and substance abuse services. She has also been a member of the council's Black and Hispanic Caucus. Before her election to the council, she had had a distinguished career for more than three decades in diverse fields, ranging from labor activism and early childhood education to immigrants' rights and the struggle for empowerment of women and minorities. Dr. Una Clark has served as a senior consultant in early education with the New York City Agency for Child Development, overseeing 38 publicly funded daycare centers. And as an adjunct professor at both Brooklyn College and Mega Evers College, she's really made her way there with the students. She's also served on the boards of numerous professional institutions and held leadership positions in various political and advocacy organizations, including the Caribbean Action Lobby. She was the first foreign-born recipient of Columbia's prestigious Vevison Fellowship. I'm working with the Congresswoman for her election, uh, for her re-election. Which, which congressman? Yvette Detroit, she's my only daughter, okay. and, 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 and my representative, so I'm busy planning her re-election. I just got off the election of the de Blasio for mayor, um, and also the election of our controller, and also our public advocate. So for the last year, I have been on skates. You've been hard. I've been working hard because I think that the city and our communities need representation that is reflective of our values. Well, it's been quite, uh, quite a lot of fun, and rightly so. We're celebrating with uh, a legend in our community, Honorable Eula Clark. Any words you'd like to share about Dr. Clark? Well, I just uh, like to uh, extend to her very happy birthday and best wishes from my family, my wife Joyce and myself, and all the people I represent in the 58th Assembly District, many of whom have benefited in extremely positive terms from her service and from her dedication uh, to helping people in the community and being a voice for the voiceless on so many occasions. I don't usually get up to congratulate the governor in the nomination. This time I'm getting up as a Puerto Rican serving uh, uh, part of the Bronx. I'm also because my son, the Bronx Board of President Ruben Diaz Jr., called me and asked me to congratulate Dr. Clark in his behalf and in behalf of the county of the Bronx, the one million point one president of the Bronx County. I congratulate my son asked me to congratulate uh, Dr. Clark because she has been a leader, she has been a pioneer, she has been uh, that kind of people, a person that really, really deserve that the governor be congratulated. So adamant about women and women's success. Why isn't it just everyone and everyone's success? Um, our society is already shaped for men, mm -hmm. and that men should call the shots. Women have to be able to assert themselves, to be in the picture, and to be able to say my contribution is as important as your contribution. We complement each other. It's not to put men down. It is to elevate women to the places where they can be. Is there anything else you'd like to add on? Um, well, there is not much to add except to say to young people that the sky is the limit. Your brain power is the real power that you have. Um, keep your eyes on the prize. Um, make sure that whatever you want to do in life, that you can achieve it. Each of us have a role to play in our society. 
And once we find what our niche is and what our um, purpose is, um, that we can accomplish great things. This is Dr. Nina Clark and the Living Suit. This evening is truly about our pioneer, the Honorable Dr. Una S.T. Clark. I'd like to thank Mr. Frederick Martin Jr. and Tiempo and the CTO and all of you for making sure that my mother continues to smell the flowers while she can smell them. Oftentimes, we have unsung heroes in our community, and it's not until they transition that we recognize all of the work, all of the effort, all of the struggle that they went through to make sure that our community be made whole and was exceptional in everything and every way that they've been represented. And that's what Dr. Clark has represented for our community, for the Caribbean diaspora, and certainly for our entire family. So I just want to say thank you to you all. Continue to support Tiempo. You just let me say, uh, you smell like, uh, I'm not say that. You won't be ever mind.
her journey through narrow roads, protruding rocks that try to crush the violence. It's all the She's all the she fearless, retrieving the voices of the unknown, restoring the hope of the vulnerable, rejuvenating the power of her words, refusing to stay in the background. The world sounds the alarm. She stood the ground. She understands her strength and weakness for her faith is in her story. Her story so full of ups and downs and the world shouted, there's no praise for her kind. Mm -hmm. She shall be in a She carried the alabaster box ready for the moment. Full of the richness of a virtuous woman, a woman that took her silence. The world saw meekness, and she stood strong in her passion. Her attitude changed the atmosphere. Not waiting to be ready, but standing ready. Mm -hmm. A woman whose ideas have a woman whose ideas have lasted in the back, leaving a pattern of preparation for tomorrow because she started today, refusing to look at the height of the mountains in her way, knowing how she can move. Refusing to weigh her success by wealth, but by encouraging those around her to, to break open the sky, celebrating differences, recognizing gifts and talents, building positive friendship. The world misunderstood. She spoke. She gathered her, her dreams and the world tossed them up the thorns, labeling them as useless. But she saw the tension and creativity. Oh, no. I know that. She did. Crowned with me, dedicated, innovative, versatile, and no Ready to capture the ready to flourish, ready to fulfill, ready to step up and out. So straighten that crown.
she was such a giant for me that I just wanted to always do everything right for her. Because you just want her to smile on you. And it's like, I would do things and I feel like I just, I just didn't get this right. And if you're sitting in the car with her, I don't know if you've had, ever had an opportunity to just drive the car. And you get most of your lessons just in these little moments like this that you feel may be so inconsequential, but they're so amazing. And she's like, you need to call this person, you need to go here, you need to go to this daycare center, and you need to pick up this petition, you need to take this turkey. And I'm like, wait, why? <laughs> and some moments were so overwhelming that I would get up in tears. And I'm like, am I not good enough? I know we have these color green and color blue doors. <laughs> because, you know, I hail from the beautiful island of Hilton Head. <laughs> <laughs> and I just would, you know, I would get on the phone and I'm like, what, what, am I, what am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be doing? I'm just, I'm just, I just can't, I just can't get it right. And as harsh as this may sound to say, I recognized one day that she broke me all the way down. And she built me up bigger and better and bolder, with more integrity, with more assertion, with, with the confidence that I need to go into any room and advocate on behalf of people without a voice. And that is what this dynamic duo, because as much as I can talk about Dr. Clark, I can't talk about Dr. Clark without talking about Congress going these back far, and without talking about the baddest, boldest, the <laughs> PDPS. Those women who celebrate women who allow us to understand that we can run for office, even though we have these little babies. And they were like, give us the baby. They won't give you my baby back. But they were like, give us the baby. And you go forth and I ran. And Lori ran. And Tish ran. And, and Diana ran. And Monique just ran. I mean, and there's so many other women. To the point where when we got to Albany, there was someone who said to us that these women, they're coming in here. They're asking for everything. I said they can get, they're asking for, they're asking for the work because they don't know what they cannot ask for. And that's because Dr. Clark emboldened us to be able to do that. And so I, I adore you. I am so grateful to you. I love that you have accepted me as your daughter, Junior. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I'm the daughter, sometimes I'm the sister. So I'm going to say daughter, Junior. And I just look forward to the continual years that you will be able to allow the same sun that shine on your plaza that you receive to shine on each and every one of us. So God bless you, God keep you, and it's just been an amazing journey with you. I love you.
ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and my privilege to present to some and introduce to others the Honorable Dr. Yuna Sylvia <laughs> Tomlinson Clark. Yes. Focus on our future and make sure that we organize and that we go out and vote that we vote 
in a way that we never hoped before. I remember we were out for 29 people who didn't fill the last census. We lost a whole seat in, um, in Congress just because there are some people who get, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get it because I didn't see the purpose coming. You don't have to necessarily see the purpose person. You just got to know what the benefit is to our community and to our community. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just want to thank you for all the work you did with David and Davis and how I came to know you mm -hmm. as a commissioner of small business for the city of New York and to thank you for your commitment to the building to the network of the city of New York. Thank you so much. Uh, before, uh, <laughs> we came back from Harlem to see you speak and to ask the question uh, step up to the mic. Don't ask me the question tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> Dr. Clark, I'm going to pop in the mic since there is a I will ask the question. As a descendant from those who can draw their lines through the room, as a descendant of those who studied under Marcus Garvey, what would you say is the role of being unapologetically rooted on culture when it comes to advocacy for women? In many ways, I think um, that would be because women have to feel hope. Um, women cannot continue to think that I have to wait on a male, whether it's your husband, a friend, or somebody else, to determine your own work. They must feel your work as a mate, as a husband, and as a friend. They must feel your way, and you must make sure that you feel that you give enough deference and respect to the head of your also, but that's not all of what life is all about. It's a partnership, and we're going to make sure that we partnership with a certain respect that male and female can feel that they each can give and make a contribution. Uh, my husband makes his contribution in his own way uh, uh, as an engineer, architect, planner. Um, he sometimes said, Why are you going to be in the street? Why do you? And I said, Honey, I'm going to help those who can't help themselves. And he said, well, you don't, I said, don't forget time, it's time to go in a thing, it's given to you, and in the final day, nobody's going to say, here goes, Dr. Unicorn, and says, that ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Mama, she was asking you, <laughs> she was asking about, about Grandpa and the Barbie movement. And oh, being a maroon. Oh, 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 what it is about the maroon and the and the barber. Okay, that, that means, okay. My, my husband was a barber. No, not dad. Right. Grandpa. Grandpa. Grandpa is sleeping on the floor. Okay. Okay. My my father was a barber, and um, uh, although my father, in his own right, is part East Indian and part Scottish, he didn't know he was not black. We are black man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So whatever was happening in Jamaica, he was a real black man and he was a guardian. And he never missed a meeting and he taught other king farmers. My father started a credit union in Silo, for those of you who are going to Jamaica, in Silo City, in the New York Park Cluster. And he said to every king farmer, at the end of the, uh, uh, each time you get your money, everybody had to bring a shilling, two shilling, five shilling. And they started a credit union this way they didn't have to go to the bank to borrow money to do their cane farm or to, uh, or to pay their workers because they created for themselves. And that was from the guardian in him. He created a, what, was, what is considered a credit union. So um, he would go to every meeting and he would come home singing all the songs. He would have to repeat all of the words of Marcus Garvey because he knew just about everything that Marcus Garvey ever said. And he was really passionate about it. And then my mother being a maroon, um, up in the hills of St. Louis, a man of Maroons, um, we fought the British off, and even today, there is still the, the, the government of the current government of Jamaica want to mine in the territory. And the Maroons are saying, no, 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 we got this in 1774, and we're not giving up an inch to the government of Jamaica unless we sign it. We sign an agreement as to what we can do on our property. So the history is there and the continuation is there. And so I'm proud of both my mom and my dad 
Um, How did they shape you? Make, making, a lot, making a lot of sacrifice. Um, there are four girls of us. Two sisters went to England and became nurses. Two of us came to the United States and became teachers. Um, Dr. Dawes, my younger sister, was an assistant principal at Blackwood Salt High School. I went to the two women, Maryland and Miriam. Long Island. Long Island, so she, she was assistant to French Indian schools on Long Island. Um, so two of us are educators and two of us are nurses. And my two brothers, my father, felt that a, a, a man must have a trade because if you have a trade, you can use that for entrepreneurship. So one brother became an auto mechanic and he bought old cars, new cars, we took care of them and sold them. So he made a whole life like that. My brother, my young, my brother that is closest to me, became a um, welder and so everything that sugar estates needed for welding and stuff. My brother was a chief person on the backside company. So my brother did a lot of work in the backside and in company with his trade. And that's what it's called in Tommy's. <laughs> Thank you for that. I know you like it. Thank you first. Let me thank you for our first notes in your presence. Second, I'm the Asian Vice President of Student Government. I was wondering what advice you would give to young scholars trying to follow in your footsteps and make an impact on their campus and in the community. I would just say, do you have a purpose? Are you moving towards your own purpose? Are you fulfilling your life? Because your life has to be. You have to feel it's fulfilled in your own self. Um, you can't copy what somebody else wants you to do. You have to do what you want to do. So uh, as a student government, whatever your major is, you have to be able to see from now. Uh, if I start here, where do I want to end? Thank you. Oh, I want to also acknowledge the Asian Cashel. She has a question. So first of all, I've I've learned something new tonight. That same Martin Scarpy book were on the coffee table in my living room. And my father would always read those Martin Scarpy books and talk to us about Martin Scarpy and what we should be doing. But I had I had to come up and say something. I was waiting for the people to listen to my president and everybody else from the office of the academic affairs. But my heart is full for me. I met you, I guess, more than 30 years ago when I was a principal and became director of early childhood. I heard of you, but the kindness that you expressed to me and that you've done to so many people, you didn't just care about. Uh, Congressman Clark and his brilliant son care about all of us. I can see why you keep this to the dollar fee because you need a prayer warrior around you all the time. Because you're so bold. The, the thing that I remember, and this is what I want you to talk about, is a lot of times women don't help each other. They, they, they don't fight against each other. But you always encourage everybody to be unified, to be humble, to be strong. I remember there were certain places I thought I couldn't sit when we should teach you to sit. And he said, what could you do? We're going up to the front, we're going to the back. I said, no, the president has to go in back. I have to send it. He said, just walk with me. And he did it every time to push me to the next level. And the director of Railroad Child Football of New York City, when I was doing that job, and the board members would have me sit in the back. It was you and Louis Reyes that said, bring the director of Railroad Child up to the front. Because when I traveled to Staten Island, they thought they get came to Cleveland when I was director of early childhood for all of New York City. So I want you to talk a little bit about things that happened to you in the city council and the city government and how you stood up to, to you gave truth to totality truth. You told them what you were going to do and you never ever backed down. And you also never turned your back on other women. You pushed all of them, you heard the truth speak. You heard many of us speak. So just tell us one of those stories when you had to stand up when they were trying to push you back, especially with Mayor Giuliani. Those stories are the best stories. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that they are so confident, and your own confidence is that is your, your key. You have to make sure that people know that.
that would be equal to, and if we don't be equal to your best that. So I always make sure that you do you know that I think it's important to do. And so during my time in the city council, I spent my first four years with David Dinkins, and that was easy. Then came Rudy Giuliani, and everything changed. <laughs> um, I remember um, when, when, the fight between David Dinkins and Giuliani with the police demonstration at City Hall. I was going to City Hall, walking to the way, and I said, excuse me. And I said, I'm a city council member. And one of the cops said, this nigga says she's a council member. <laughs> so I, I looked at him and I said, you better get off. I showed him my back and I said, you better get off my way. And he looked at me again. And I said, I just asked you to get off my way. I'm getting into City Hall. And he looked at the other and he said, should I let her in? And I said, if you don't let me in, one of you is going to have to take the other one of you in the jail to get Which of you now rest the other one? So that I went in. And I was firm that I was going to get the one that they had. They gave me my way to go to see on. And I was burning. I was burning. And I went in and I said, one of those cops up here. They were the enemy, and I looked at the cop and I said, Where I come from, they are the niggas, so I don't know who to talk to. They're not talking to me. I don't come from a place where they're the niggas. And that was it. I went in. The press found out about it, and so the press blew it up. The more that I wanted to blow it up, I did it. This was between this cop and myself, but since he made it so, it came out in the press, and I had to. You know, resolve myself. And then one of the times I needed to talk to you about, because right here at Mental Revolution is what took place. Um, after the Wimba incident, um, everyone doesn't know, tell people about the Wimba. Who the Wimba? The Wimba is the Haitian American um, that was brutalized in the 70th precinct with the Green State, and um, we decided to the community um, all of the let me, let me put it in a nice way. All of the liberal Caucasians who usually want to make demonstration in our community was ready to come and church and start a demonstration. And so I asked the leaders in the Asian community, let's meet and talk about how we're going to get to resolution to this matter, how we're going to make sure that there is justice. So we came up with a strategy. We're supposed to meet at the police headquarters in, in Manhattan. In Manhattan, so we were all organized to go and make the comments, and you can only bring no more than 50 people in the room that was control us. So, in the meantime, Juliana figured out that she didn't really want to because people said, Don't come. So, we decided we would have a different start. So, we decided we would do the discussion here, but we had already decided what demands we were going to make um, to get justice. We decided we're not going to break up our community, we're not going to set our community on fire because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for us to act like savages. And, when, and I said to everybody, whatever we destroy them, we go home. And I reminded them what happened in Bushwick and, and um, Broadway. I said, all of those people who owned them were white folks. So once they burned them down, they were able to collect their money and they're all in front of the world. And the place is such a desert right now, nobody is doing anything over there. And we can't afford to do that because our people have two jobs one to buy a house, one to get enough money to pay down a house, and we have to take care of our kids, so we can't afford it. So we decided on a new strategy. And all of it took place right here at the Germans College. And we made sure, step by step, whatever we planned, that we would go one by one and that we would make sure that they, they um, let us know who they're interviewing, why they're interviewing them, and what, what the outcome is going to be. Um, it's out of that, many of you should know. Um, I made a lot of demands on the Julia. It was about to um, privatize King's County Hospital Base, and basically put it up on offer to sell the hospital. And part of it was the rebuilding of King's County Hospital, because whatever he had against, um, Clarence Norman, as well as um, Van, he decided he was not going to rebuild King's County Hospital, he was going to privatize it. 
you know, going to pick up on whatever mission we're going to be privatizing. So I got him to the Bill Gates camp, and he decided, all right, I'm going to put it on a particular basis. So we decided to use it. We were making the video seat now as the first one, and then we decided that the second $80 million dollars would go to the mental health because we closed down the group, she did it. And, and so that's what we decided to put everything on one campus. And King's County Hospital. So that was the result of the investment in King's County, that was the result of the UMA settlement. And very quickly, I'm going to know that that was a settlement that I negotiated on behalf of our community. And I need to make sure we can make a whole community that we didn't have to put anything down and that we could get the kind of um, return that we needed. Institution, and you don't have to be a 
for pouring all your love in Catholic Wheel. Mm -hmm. She's not Catholic Press Love, but she's a mentor. She's very dear to my heart. And as a student here, I got so much support and guidance from her. And to turn the spotlight for a moment on your daughter, Congresswoman Bechard, I remember being a student here freshman, like a mid freshman year. And I was like, I need to go to the Washington House, and I need to see the congresswoman, and I'm about to take the police students with me. And uh, having Dr. Blair and other folks around me made that possible, and you opened your office for us, and you welcome us. And the thing about it is the seal of Megan Evers College. So what I've learned that when you reach out to certain people, you say you're from Megan Evers College, you don't open wide. And I'm also honored to be in the room because hearing, I was, I got, this is the first time I heard Dr. Cashel say that she was afraid to come to the front of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say this, Dr. Cashel is also a doctor mentor of mine. I can call at any time for any support, and she's there. And this is the beauty about women supporting women and really just pointing to each other. And we can see the, the amazing things that we are doing. So, I have to come to the front of the room to say thank you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 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 the college group. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm talking to you now as a trustee of this university and not all of the other institutions flourish. And that's because they have alumni come back, give something to them. Develop scholarships so that other students can get scholarships to be in India. And I'm not just saying that because of presidency. This is the first woman in class. And the only way she's going to be successful is all of us women and draw the men behind us, make her a success. Make sure that decisions she makes, if you don't like it, that you ask for a meeting. Don't walk in the street and start running the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Castro was a successful superintendent of schools because I invested millions in her school. And why, and why did you invest in District 17? Why did you invest in school District 17? So I don't think that everybody in the city is not the same time. It took me some great consideration after I was qualified to be a citizen to become one. So I understand I'm going to be a little bit. And then I said, so what am I waiting for? Especially if you come from a country that you can do citizenship. Why don't you please let me both ways and do what you need to do? So I just want to tell everybody, I want to make sure that you understand that the civic community and responsibility is very important. This institution can only be strong. So we are strong in our community. If something happens and we gotta go to what is second street to raise hell or make a reference, I wanna make sure that everybody that over here can put the good cell on behalf of Mr. Reference um, can stand on your own to support the institution. 
Because for me, this is growth time for the medical study. The institution has to work. And yeah. we can only do it with all souls in it to make sure that it works. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pamela Harmon, and Dr. Clark, I just want to say thank you. The word says, train your child in the way that he should go, and when he gets older, he will not depart. You bet I understand how you feel because I also had to go with my mom to events. And many of the events was with um, Dr. Clark, Adelaide Miller, Gwen Harmon, those individuals who showed us I stand on when they had the Cypher Action Council. Yeah. And they had us to meet on Saturday to prepare for exams. There was no way that we wanted to do that, but we didn't have a choice. We had to do it. And so I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Clark, because as so many have said, um, you are an educator. And it, and it was in the black community. And it wasn't about, my, my roots are Southern, um, and it wasn't about you know, where you came from, and, and it wasn't any of that. All of, all of the women came together knowing that they needed a solid foundation. And you were part, and so many others were a part of that foundation. And I can clearly say that I am where I am today because of the seeds that you and so many others have sown into the lives of children that were very, very young and did not know which way to go. But you all insisted that this is the way that we were going to go, this is what we were going to do, and there were no ifs and or buts. So even to the point of supporting Shirley Chisholm at the Bernard Hotel, when they were having those breakfasts and stuff like that, and we put on our Sunday vest, and had to go, and like you said, you bet you were sitting in a corner or something, um, where I packed up shoes. <laughs> and that's, that's, what we, that's what we had to do, but God bless you, and, um, and I know that you're going to continue because you are a woman of purpose. You are indeed a phenomenal woman. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Clark. Um, I usually don't Say much more than Sean. 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 Yeah, Sean for What's Up, man. So I'm usually behind the scenes, but before I started What's Up, back in 1999, I had a new camera, and I'm a new had gotten shot on Wheeler Avenue. And about, so I heard, I think LIB said, like, folks are going to go up there. So I, I took the train, I think the number two and three, all the way up to the Bronx. And it was about a thousand people on that block that day. And it, like, there weren't, I think Diaz was the official of the son or the father. And you were right there with them. And you were the same, you know, Giuliani period, so folks were upset, I believe. And you were right there and you were just talking and, you know, so I want to say I honor you for that, you know, and you kind of inspired me to kind of keep the focus and, you know, keep the pedal to the pedal, you know? Thank you for that. We're coming to a close now, and there are some individuals that I know would like to say some close remarks, but I would like to also acknowledge some faculty members that are here and have them bring some closing remarks as well. Um, I see Professor Alexander, Professor Colson, and also the former Deputy Borough President, who is a longtime adjunct in our department, Professor Rhonda Bender. We would like for you to come up. The first one tomorrow with Joe Pam of Judges and Professor Binder following him. Good evening. Good evening. Or should I say great evening? Great evening. Wow. Dr. Clark, you once again made history. Indeed, the namesake of the woman in government here at Medgar College. And this is also such a historic time for women in government, thanks to your leadership and you being the trailblazer before us. And we don't have to look that far to see the fruits of your labor with the amazing congresswoman, our vice presidency, our attorney general, 
the governor, and now we have uh, more of a balance in our city council. And it's because of your leadership, and I know you're a petite woman, but you pack so much power into that punch, and you have broad, broad shoulders, as everyone heard today. And so, in addition to being such an inspiration for women in government like myself, we've also heard that you've been an advocate for the African American community, for immigrants, for our students, for seniors, and also for the Indo Caribbean and Indian community. And so this auspicious week while we're celebrating Hawaii, mm -hmm. and we're celebrating the triumph of love and life and knowledge over ignorance on behalf of Medgar Evers College, I want to really thank you for being that bright, bright light and shining that way for us women in government and to be the namesake for this series. God bless you richly. Thank you. We love you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Dr. Emma Clark. I just love you. I love your daughter. Um, I'm so thankful to be here to really celebrate you, and we're so glad that you so graciously uh, accepted Dr. Blair's request to be our opener for this series of uh, Women in Government, uh, because we know the challenges that women have and continue to have. Uh, in government, uh, my colleague uh, Terry Coulson, uh, uh, she had to leave because of you know the same issues that we continue to have, right? Babysitting, having to take care of children. Um, where is here? All right, Terry, still here. Okay, good. Um, but you know we're really so thankful for all the work that you've done um, and continue to do, um, and may God continue to bless you. Um, it's always good to, to live a purposeful life. Um, and from you know what your daughter has shared with us and the testimonies that were shared today, we know that that's what you have, have done. And so we're so proud of you um, as part of the Negra College team. Um, I, I love that you mentioned the donations um, because all the other colleges do reach out to uh, alumni for donations every year. Right, and so it is important that we plant that seed while we can, because um, you want to always give back to good, uh, what what has fed you. Right, you've been fed by the department. Now you're, it's your turn to to do the same. Um, and we're having a session tomorrow, um, uh, continuing to be women in government. I will have the judges here. Uh, it will be in three twelve. So everyone is invited to come. Um, and yeah, we're so, so thankful. Love you. Um, continue to do the work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Hobson, you want to come up. And also, Council Member Narcisse in it. I don't know where Dr. Cash will turn, but she has one final act to do. <laughs> and um, Reverend Cockfield, if you. Just hold on a few minutes, you can pray us out. So yes, this is going to be quick. So tomorrow at 6.30, we're going to have seven sitting judges. Um, they're going to be at the Curtis College for our women uh, in government. So we have uh, we have Judge uh, Keisha uh, in line. We have Judge Wendy Tucson. We have Judge Patria um, Hope. Uh, Hello. So we have a variety of judges. I'm asking all of you that uh, would like to be part of the call, please come out. And this is in honor of you, Dr. Clark, and all that you do to pour into us. We're continuing to pour it back into our students and, and our families here at Edgar College. So we again want to thank you for all that you do and for Congresswoman. Thank you so much for being a part of the community. There's another firebrand here. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I know it's toward the end. I'm going to end things off. Um, I want to say thank you. It is a wonderful program that we are putting together for this wonderful, wonderful human being. So I'm not going to even talk about the power. I'm talking about the heart. The heart is the right place, driving you to do the thing that you've been doing over the years. And God kept you going. And keep, you got to keep the going, by the way, because you really push people to bring the best out of everyone. And thank you. And because of you, I 
I'm not afraid of opening my mouth in the city council. <laughs> right now, my, my face is all over yep. the internet because correctional officer put me up there saying, I, I guess I'm the problem when it comes to solitary confinement. Because when I went visit, when I went over there to visit as a mom and I see the face of the young men and young women in the cages, to me it's wrong. We have to do better. Other countries have done better, and that's the reason I have the strength to tell people, no, you have to do better. And that's what I'm talking about, Dr. Yeah. Lina I love you. You are the best. And wow. thank you. Oh, beautiful. Wait, 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 go back, Dr. Thank you. 